Hey, Freedom House, it's Father's Day weekend, and it's been a busy week. I'm just now getting caught up on all my thank you notes. If I could have one second just to fill out a thank you note to my dad, and maybe your dad, too. Just give me one second here. Can I have some piano playing thank you note music? Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you dads, for always being there, watching mom feed me, change my diapers, and dress me for high school. My mom still dresses me. And she dresses you nicely. I mean, you look stunning. These are all her clothes. Oh, well, that's fooled me. Thank you, Dad, for keeping the pulled up socks look with sandals in style. And for setting fashion trends like pulled up socks with sandals. Is there something wrong with that? That's good, right? Thank you, Dads, for explaining the way of life, like the birds and bees. It's good to know that babies come from Cabbage Patch Kids. <laughs> Do they come from the kids or from the patch? You know what? It's a patch. <laughs> Thank you, Dad, for being a great example of what it means to be consistent. It's comforting to know you can always count on hearing the immortal words, go ask your mom. <laughs> Thank you, Dads, for teaching me how to use duct tape for everything. Last one, here we go. You ready? You sad? No? Okay. Thank you, dads, for showing me how to treat a lady. Now, if you only showed me how to work a toilet seat. That's it for thank you notes, folks. Happy Father's Day. Dads, have a great day. We love you. Come on, let's give it up for our dads. Come on, let's give it up for our dads. Very good, very good. Make sure you give your dad a call, give him a wet sloppy hug or something like that. Hey, let's welcome all of our live streamers, Buenos Dios, Mexico, Surf's Up, Cali, Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, New York. Come on, somebody, Washington, D.C., anybody from Ohio here today? There we go, three of them. And Maryland. Come on, let's give it up for Maryland. Thank you guys for joining us today. It's going to be a great day. We're starting this new series called Game Changers. Game Changers. I believe that any, you know, I, I was reading this recently, that, that, um, that all it takes is just one moment, one second in a game, and everything can change. <clears throat> I believe that the right person with the right attitude Seizing the right app opportunity can literally change the whole game. And I'm not just talking about games like football, baseball, basketball, hockey, uh, racing, or whatever, golf, whatever. I'm talking about the game of life. You know, all of us have uh, what I believe opportunities that are presented to us, and we have to seize those moments. We have to take advantage of every one of those moments. And I believe we're one conversation away from greatness. I think all it takes is one word from God, and your whole life can completely change. Turn upside down, go, go, get better, your marriage can change, everything can change. And one of the ways that we have to do that is we have to learn how to face failure. Everybody say failure. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about how to face failure. You know, it, um, there were uh, Michael Jordan, the, the best basketball player of all time, um, he had... I think there were over 242 game-winning shots. I mean, last second as the time is clicking off that he, that he made. But most people don't know that there were over 9,000 that he missed, that he missed. I want to talk specifically today about golf. Uh, kind of, I love golf. Golf's like my favorite. Yes, I got one golfer. How many golfers in the house do I have today? Now, I just, I just want to make you ease. Ladies, um, my, I go home every Sunday pretty much and watch golf for about four and a half hours. My wife is so awesome. She sits there. You know, she'll peek up every now and then from her computer or telephone and say, now, what happened right there? And I know she really doesn't care, but she just loves me, <laughs> and she just asks me about it. She's been with me one time to play golf. One time, she rode in the cart. I let her drive. And uh, it was a fantastic, she asked me after the round was over, it was about four and a half hours later, she goes, I don't know what in the world you do this for. I, I mean, why, why you do this, I have no idea. This is not fun for me. I would never enjoy this. I mean, you got birds twerping, you got, uh, you got, you got beautiful scenery. She said, but I don't have a signal <laughs> for my phone. So anyway. So she's been one time. So if you don't know all the terminology, that's cool to give you a little lesson, a little, a little homework. You can learn something and just, you know, impress your, your husband, your friend, whoever. Impress a man with your knowledge of golf. And so golf is about facing failure. 
You, you literally have to almost face failure every time you hit the ball because there's the potential for massive failure. You can hit it in the woods. You can knock it somewhere you're not supposed to hit it. You can find yourself in a sand trap, which is basically a big hole with sand in it, and it's not good to be in there. Um, and, and so you have to face that on a regular basis. Every shot is different. I believe that golf is one of the most difficult sports on the planet because every shot is different. Every time you hit the ball, there are different conditions. Your ball is sitting somewhere different than it was before. You never have the same lie. You never have the same win. The conditions can change in an instant. I played golf when it rained, snowed, was, you know, warm, cold, doesn't matter. I mean, everything changes. And all of that changes or affects your game. You know, just uh, about 200 miles away, 250 miles away at Pinehurst, is one of the, we're having one of the greatest golf tournaments of the year called the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open. I don't know who's winning right now. I haven't been able to watch it the last couple of days, but it's, it's always an epic time, an epic time. And as a professional, if you're a professional golfer, and, and here's the cool thing about the U.S. Open, anybody can play in the U.S. Open. All you have to do is qualify. I, do, I mean, I could play in the U.S. Open. Not going to happen, but I mean, I could, I could definitely do it if I, if I was good enough. But the professionals, in order to win a tournament, they have to win four different days, four rounds. They have to have the lowest score after four, four days of golf, 18 whole, holes of golf each day and have the lowest score after that period of time. So you can imagine there's a lot of opportunity for failure, tons of opportunity. If you average about 70 shots per round, I mean, that's a lot of mistakes can happen during that time. And so, so there have been some epic meltdowns in golf history. You may know one of them, a guy by the name of Arnold Palmer. Anybody ever had an Arnold Palmer? You ever had a drink called the Arnold Palmer? Okay, that's sweet tea with lemonade. If you want to kick it up a notch, you can have a Troy Maxwell, just add some pineapple juice. That's what I call a Troy Maxwell. Go any restaurant, they'll hook you up with a Troy Maxwell. Some of you go to Ryan's today, ask for a Troy Maxwell, they'll give it to you. You think I'm lying, just go ask them and they'll give it to you because I've spread it all around Charlotte. No, I'm just kidding. Arnold Palmer, one of the greatest golfers of all time, 1966. He's playing in the U.S. Open. He has a, a six-shot lead over, um, I can't remember the guy's name, but anyway, he, he blows it big time. The last nine holes of the, go of the game blows it, totally melts down, ends up losing the tournament. 30 years later, you may remember a guy by the name, uh, Billy Casper was the guy's name he beat. Uh, Greg Norman, 30 years later, 1996, the shock from Australia. Epic, cataclysmic failure. Come on, everybody say failure. I mean, horrible failure. He, has, he is um, six shots ahead of Nick Faldo going into the last round. He has led every round leading up to. Now, the Masters, if you don't know where the Masters is, the Masters is held in Augusta, Georgia. At, at one of the greatest golf courses in the world. It's on my bucket list. Number one on my bucket list, Augusta National. If you would like your prayers answered, take your pastor to Augusta. <clears throat> if you want special treatment at church, get me on Augusta. Please, Lord, amen. That's heaven for any golfer, and that would be heaven for me. Anyway, so Greg Norman is six shots ahead of Nick Faldo, totally fails. Last three holes, loses the tournament. I think, I think we showed a picture of him up there. But I want to talk about, I want to kind of minute, mention a guy by the name of Rory McIlroy. Rory McIlroy was one of the, uh, he's basically named, deemed the next Tiger Woods. He's a young guy. And in 2011, he was playing in Augusta at the Masters, he had led all three rounds leading up to the last day, and he just imploded. Terrible, horrible, the worst thing you could ever watch on television. I watched it in 2011, and it's just devastating. The commentators were on him. He, would, he was hooking shots and almost hit a house in Augusta, and you just don't do that as a professional. It was horrible to watch. It was horrible to hear. As he led, he lost eight strokes, went down from eight in the lead, and totally failed. And it made it worse. Everybody was on his back. They said, this guy will never recover from this, never, ever be anywhere close to the top 10, if, if even make it. I mean, it was horrible, but something amazing happened. Two months after everybody basically pushed him to the side, he comes back and wins the U.S. Open. And he doesn't just win it, y'all. He doesn't just win it. He wins it by the largest margin of any golfer in U.S. history. 
it was amazing to see him make a comeback. Everybody say comeback. See, that's what I believe today is for you. Today is your day of comeback. Today is the day for you to make a comeback. It's t- it, I don't care what you've been through or what you failed in your life, whether it's a business, whether you've been through divorce, whether you've had relationship failure, school failure, no matter what it may be, financial failure, I believe today is the day where God lets you know that you can make a comeback because you're the right person, you got the right attitude, and guess what? Now's the time. Right now is the moment. Now, when you think about failure, when you think about failure, who in the Bible jumps out at you, first of all? Just yell out a name. Peter. Everybody says Peter because he was the one who had epic failure. Look at Matthew chapter 26 with me. We'll stay right around Matthew 26 for the entire service. Matthew chapter 26. Jesus has been arrested, and he's getting ready to go to in front of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish court. He was going to stand trial in front of them um, because they accused him. They falsely accused him, accused Jesus. But Peter decides to follow Jesus all the way to this particular, uh, this, this, this trial that Jesus is. But he just stays far enough away that he doesn't, he really isn't seen so much by Jesus. But look what happens. Look what happens in Matthew 26, verse 69. It says, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard. So he, he gets close enough where he can see Jesus, Jesus can see him, and a servant girl, verse 69, and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Look at what happened in, in verse 70. But he, what does it say? He denied it before them all, saying, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're saying. What, what are you talking what you talking about? What, what are you talking about? I don't know what you are saying. He denied his best friend, the guy I've been with for three and a half years. I don't even know what you're talking about. Look at verse 70. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you're saying. In verse 71, and when he had gone out of the gateway, so he leaves this courtyard because, I mean, he's been caught, y'all. I mean, he got caught, so he goes outside of the courtyard, and another girl comes up to him and says, hey, listen, this fellow, this fellow right here, points him out. This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, verse 72. But again, Peter, what does it say? Come on, that's two failures. Fail, fail. He denied him. Not only that, it says he denies him with an oath. In other words, what he does is what my mom told me never to do, to swear to God. That's what he did. He says, I swear to God, I swear, I swear on my life. This was a, an incredibly powerful Greek term that Peter uses in this moment. In other words, he is denouncing that he even knows. Listen, I don't even know him. This man, I don't know this man. I don't know who he is. I don't know this whole situation. I'm just a bystander. I'm just visiting. Verse 73, and a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Verse 74, raka, saka. He starts cussing. <laughs> he starts cussing. It says, then he, don't get all holy on me because I know you drive in Charlotte. <laughs> I'll be getting all holy. Then he began to curse and swear, curse and swear. Three times Peter fails. I do not know the man. Immediately the rooster, rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You will fail three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. One, one other gospel, Luke says in verse 22, of chapter 22, verse 61, it says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Could you imagine what that felt like for Peter? And he runs out. See, here's the deal. I want you to write down four things in concerning facing your failure. Number one is we all fear failure. We all fear it. And Satan, if we're not careful, can use that fear to incapacitate us in our life. He can use that fear to incapacitate us in our life. He will draw on that fear. So we have to learn how to face those fears. We have to learn how to face the fear of failure. Just one chapter earlier in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is telling a story about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who went on a far journey, Matthew 25. And he says, he says the master, this master takes some, some gifts, some talents, and he gives it to three of his servants. He says, he gives him five, gives one servant five, he gives one servant two, and he gives one servant one. 
And he says, I'm going away. Do with what you will with what you have. And so he leaves away. Now, this is a picture of what Jesus asks of us today as believers. He has given us something. He has given us a talent. He has given us a gift. He has given us potential. Given us potential. Some of us five, some of us two, some of us one. The, the amount is not so much the important part. It's what you do with what you're given that's the important thing. And so the five guy turns it into five, ten. The two guy turns it into four. But I want you to see what happens to the guy who was given one talent in Matthew 25, verse 24. It says, then he who had received the one talent after the master had returned from his trip, he wanted an account of what he did. And that's what's going to happen to you and I. When we stand before Jesus, listen, as believers, you're not going to account for your mistakes because they're covered by the blood. You're going to account for what you did with what God gave you, your potential. And so he says, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Okay, time out, time out. How, How did he think he was a hard man? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Reaping where you have not sown. And gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was, come on, you can say it better than that. And I was, come on, everybody together. I was, he feared failure. So you know what he did? I went and I hid your talent. Notice he never took even ownership of the talent. The other two guys took ownership of the talent. He said, this is your talent. It's not even mine. I didn't even take this as mine. I'm just renting this. I'm just leasing this. And he went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, what you, what that, look, there you have what is yours. Verse 28, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has, talent, who has 10 talents. See, I believe failure has a voice. And if we're not careful, that voice can talk us out of the steps that God wants us to take. The voices of failure. This guy listened to the voices of failure that say things like this. Don't even try. Remember the last time you did that? Remember the last time you started that business, what happened to you? You remember the last time you spent that money? You remember the last time you got in that relationship? Hey, you, you know what? You're not good enough. That's just a stupid idea. What makes you think that's going to work? That's the voice of failure. See, if we listen to the voice of failure, we will always fear failure. We will allow fear to determine. Now, it says that he, he, he said to him, I knew you to be a hard man. Is God hard? No. But see, that's what religion is created from, fear. Religion is created from fear. If you don't act right, then God's sitting up there on his throne. He's got a frown on his face. He's waiting to whack you with his, his rod, saying, oh, you're a bad boy. You're a bad girl. You better do better next time. That's not how God sees us. He he sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ, a lens of love. He loves us. He doesn't, he's not sitting, and see, that's the motivation of fear. You know, fear is a motivator, but it's not the best motivator. Love is the best motivator because love always produces positive obedience, not resentful obedience. Come on, that was worth coming right there. See, if you fear, listen, it will rob you of your potential. You know what the master did? He took the talent from the one who was given one, and he gave it to the one who actually could multiply the talent. If you, if you settle in the fear of failure, then you will be robbed of your potential. It will isolate you. Fear will isolate you. It says he went and he hid his talent. You'll hide. You'll isolate. Fear paralyzes. If we succumb to the fear of failure, then we'll be paralyzed. There was a guy, I heard a story recently of a guy who, who owned monkeys. He had a bunch of monkeys. Uh, he was a strange guy, I guess. But uh, he decided to do this test where he wanted to see how the monkeys would respond. And so he took four monkeys, he put them in this room, and he built this long stalk, and he put a, a bunch of bananas at the top of the stalk. And he just left the room. Monkeys were there. <laughs> You know, I just want to act it out a little bit for you. <clears throat> and the first monkey gets, just see, they, they all see the bananas. The first monkey looks up, sees the bananas, and jumps up the stalk, runs up the stalk. He gets about halfway up. The guy takes a fire hose and shoots the monkey, knocks him down off the ho- stalk. I know, don't call PETA. I didn't do it, okay? <laughs> Second monkey sees the bananas. Shoots up the stalk, gets about three-quarters of the way up. God does the same thing, shoots him with the hose. He drops off. 
third monkey jumps up, <laughs> jumps up, the, gets him ready to reach the bananas, getting ready to grab it, shoots him with the hose, drops him down, doesn't get the banana. The fourth guy, fourth monkey, jumps up there. He's so excited. He thinks, I'm the one. I can make it. He makes it all the way to the top. He's ready to grab a bunch of bananas, shoots him with the hose. He falls down. This happens many times to eventually there's a stalk, a bunch of bananas, four monkeys. Nobody's going for the bananas. And so what the guy does is he starts replacing each one of the monkeys with one, replacing each one of them out. So he takes one of the monkeys out that was shot with the hose and puts a fresh one in. The fresh one gets in the room. First thing he does, he sees the bananas. He takes off for the stalk to go up the stalk to get the bananas. The other three tackle him and pull him off of the stalk. <laughs> and in probably monkey language, say, you don't want to do that. <laughs> it's not good. Happens a few times, and finally, there's one monkey with three of the other ones, and he replaces one monkey at a time to where there are four monkeys. Each time he would replace a monkey, the ones that were shot with the hose would pull him down to eventually there's four monkeys that have never been shot with the hose, and none of them are going for the bananas. Because fear is transferable. It is generational. And 6,000 years ago, listen, Adam transferred the fear that came from the shame of sin down through our generation. And if we're not careful, we can easily succumb to that fear and be paralyzed and never get the gift, the, the bananas at the top of your stalk. But there's, there's, there's good on the other side of this. There's good. This is, this is the, the good thing is, is that God doesn't give us fear. He replaces our fear with, guess what? Faith. Faith. He gives us faith to replace the fear. Notice what it says in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Look at this verse. Look at this verse. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of. God has not given you a spirit of. Say it out loud. He didn't give you fear. He gave you a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. In other words, he gave you faith to replace fear. Your fear. Any fear you have in your life can re be replaced with the faith that comes from God. God gives us, the Bible tells us that he, we all of us have been given a measure of faith to overcome any obstacle that we may face in our life. Any mountain that's presented in front of us, any problem, any challenge, any trial, the Bible tells us all it takes is a mustard seed of faith in order to overcome that mountain, in order to take that mountain and toss it into the sea. What is your mountain? Maybe your mountain is anger. Maybe your mountain is timidity. Maybe your mountain is isolation. Maybe your mountain is divorce. Maybe your mountain is a business failure. Maybe your mountain is a relationship failure. Maybe your mountain is school. I, I don't know what your mountain is, but you have been given enough faith to handle any mountain you're facing today. Because God, listen, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. You know, as a man, one of the tough things about um, uh, being a dad, being a man, being a pastor, being a leader, is many times we don't like to share our failures. We don't like to talk about our failures. We don't like to talk about our fears because we've got to be a man. We don't have to do that. You know, we don't, I don't want to tell you about my failures. I have a lot, I have a lot of failures. I have a lot of insecurities. For the longest time, when we started this church, I would come around the corner, whether it was at University of Meadows where we started, whether it was at Stony Creek, or even at this building, I would come around the corner hoping that somebody would be here on Sunday. I knew there would be about 20 or 25 because I paid them. <laughs> so I knew we'd have at least 25 at church that weekend. But, but those insecurities that would... I mean, literally, the enemy would try to work on me, trying to get me to fear, well, what's going to happen when then nobody shows up? And then it just starts this train of thought that you start going down. And I immediately realized, no, 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 no. God told me to start this church. God told me to stand up and preach the word. God told me to do this. And if God is with me, it doesn't matter who's against me. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about? I love what they say in Australia. You know, we're kind of celebrating Australia today because our Australian friends are here. They, they have a term that says, just have a go. Have a go. Go for it. Go for it. See, here's the second thing. I spent a lot of time on that one, but I want to fly through these other three. Here's the second thing. We will fail. Just, just embrace it right now. You're going to fail. But it's all right. Peter. Check Peter. Let's go back to Peter again. Here's what Jesus said to Peter. Listen, not a week before he failed three times, not 
a day before he failed three times in the same chapter. Hours before he failed. Listen to what, listen to what Jesus, Jesus, hello, G, the Son of God said to Peter. And he really says it to all of us. Then Jesus said to them, he's having dinner, he's having supper with, with the 12, you know, they're having biscuits and gravy and just having a good old time pot roast. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble. All of you are going to blow it. All of you are going to fail because of me <laughs> this night. I'm the, I'm the cause of your failing, failure, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered, verse 32. But after I've been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter, <laughs> look at Peter said, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, guess what? I'll never fail. <laughs> Could you imagine what that was like? Because you know Jesus knew. He knew he was going to fail. <laughs> Jesus probably chuckled a little bit. And Peter says, I will never. Jesus said to him, next verse, assuredly. Let me tell you the truth, Peter. I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me. You ain't going to just fail once, Peter. You ain't going to just fail twice, Peter. You're going to fail Three times, three times, buddy, you're going to fail. Look at what he said. Peter said to him, even if I have to die. This is funny. Even if I have to die, I will not deny you. And I love the last few words. And so said all the disciples. Yeah, Peter, I'm with you, buddy. I'm there with you, man. I got your back. Woo, I'm ready. Come on, bring it on. Soldiers show up in Garden of Gethsemane just a few verses later. Guess who's the first to go? All the 11 disciples, boom, out of there. <laughs> History. Peter follows Jesus in. See, we're all going to fail. Let me tell you a sure way of never failing. Don't do anything. <laughs> Don't do anything. Don't do anything big for God. Don't take any chances. Don't take any risks. Don't do anything. Don't do anything. But see, here's how we overcome understanding we're all failed. Just write these down if you want to write this down. T -t -t Take some notes. Allow yourself to feel the disappointment but not the disapproval. Allow yourself to feel the sorrow, the disappointment of the failure, but don't allow that disappointment to take you to disapproval. Now, this is extremely important because if the disappointment turns to disapproval, then that disapproval will define you. And then you will define yourself as a failure. And if you want to write this down as well, as well, failure is an event. It's not a person. So just because you failed in business, just because you failed in marriage, just because you failed in school, just because you failed in that relationship, just because you failed in your finances with your money, just because you failed yesterday, just because you failed on the way to church. Come on, somebody. Just because you failed in traffic again in Charlotte, <laughs> Rackasacka, just because you failed doesn't make you a failure. Amen. See, here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing about God. This is what I love about God. God's love, his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, all of who he is is not dependent upon your success. Come on, I don't think that sunk in. God's love, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's grace... Everything that he gives you is not dependent upon your success. He doesn't look at you and go, well, I guess he's not a success. He failed again. I don't love him anymore. No, that's not the way it works. He doesn't approve of you based on whether you make it or not. You're approved because of your faith in Jesus Christ. It's not about whether that business succeeded or not. It's not about whether you made $10 million. That has nothing to do with it. Because God doesn't look at you that way. He sees you through the blood of Jesus. Isn't that good to know? Man, that takes, I don't know about you, but that's like, huh, that takes so much weight off of my shoulders. I don't, God, I don't have to do anything to approve myself in heaven. I've already been approved. I made, I'm, I got an A plus in heaven. I'm good. And failure is an event. It's not a person. Matter of fact, sometimes God orchestrates our failures. Remember, we all fail because it's the failures, I believe this, I believe that it's our failures that teach us the most because, see, many times we evaluate way more our failures than we do our successes, don't we? 
We celebrate our successes. Yeah, I did it. woo Yes, yes, amen. Hallelujah. Got the bananas. Yes. But we never evaluate those successes. But when we fail, man, we can learn. Uh, um, you know, Tony Cruz. You know Tony Cruz is? Cru- Tony Cruz is the one who does the Old Spice commercials. He's so funny. He's awesome. He's the one that uh, he, he, he flexes his, his pecs. What did I say? What did I say? Tony. Oh, Terry. Sorry, Terry Cruz. Thank you. Um, so so he, 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 he's awesome. And so I saw he wrote a book recently called Manhood. And he said, listen, if you're going to fail, fail big. Fail huge. Go all out. Make it the biggest fail you've ever had. Because out of that, you will become a better person every single time. Because you take risks. Here's the second thing I want you to, say, I want you to hear. Well, let me read this verse to you in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. It says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. They help us develop endurance. Our failures allow us to occupy God's blessings instead of just visit them. Uh, Our failures help us to maintain the, the, the place that God wants us to be because what our failures do is they reveal weaknesses that many times we ignore. And they help us strengthen the areas that we need to strengthen. And so, so what God does, sometimes he lets us fail. It's called a test. Because your failures many times grow your faith way more than your successes. And so, God, see, our faith only grows when it's being challenged. Many people say, well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yeah, that, it comes by hearing, but it's only grown by trials and challenges and failures and, and stuff that, that happens to us that draws closer to God. So here's what you have to do. So number one, we all fear failure. Number two, we all fail. Number three, we've got to take big, honking, crazy faith risks. All of us do. I don't believe faith exists outside of risk. You have to take a risk. You have to use that faith, that God-given faith that, that he gave you. You have to operate in it. And guess what happens when you use your faith? Hebrews eleven six. 6, it says, but without faith is it impossible to please God. In other words, when you use your faith, guess what you do? You put a smile on God's face. He goes, I gave them that. Look what they're doing. They're using my faith. They're using the faith that I gave them. Oh, yes. That is awesome. See, we cannot play it safe to please God. Can't play it safe and please God. Remember, we're talking about Peter. One of the reasons why I believe he was able to make a big comeback, which he did, which I'll talk about in just a second, is, 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 is when he got out of the boat. Do you remember, remember when he was in the boat with the 12 disciples, 11 disciples, him and the 11 guys, and Jesus is walking on the water. He walks across the water, and, and, and everybody thinks that he's a ghost. All the disciples are like, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And Peter says, I think it's Jesus. Hey, Jesus, if it's you, command me to get out of, the, out of the boat. So he gets out of the boat, steps out of the boat, walks on the water, and most people would say that Peter failed because he sank. Can I tell you who really failed? The 11 that didn't get out of the boat. They could have all got out of the boat. All of them could have walked on water. When are you going to get out of the boat? Some of you got some big old tents in your boat. You got burners making hot dogs and and chili in your boat. You've set up shop. You got a 70-inch Vizio in your boat. It's time to get out of the boat. It's time to take some faith risks. It's time to pray some crazy prayers. Do some crazy stuff. Start some crazy businesses. That idea that's been swirling around in your head, go for it in Jesus' name. Are you with me? Come on, if it lines up with the Bible, then go for it. Step out of the boat. You know why? You know why? Because if fear, if your greatest fear is failure, your greatest pain will be regret. If your greatest fear is failure, then your greatest pain will be regret. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in the if I only would have world. If only I would have committed to my marriage. If only I would have said that to my son. If only I would have chose that business. If only I would have. If only I would have. Regret, man. I don't want to live in that world. So guess what? I'm going to take some big old honking risks. I'm going to take some chances, man. I'm going to risk it all. You know, the tough thing about risk is as you become successful, it's a little more challenging because there's a lot more at risk, a lot more to lose. 
A lot more to lose. I can tell you, you know, as, a, as somebody that's, take, that, that's seen a church grow and, 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 you know, I had a business before this. And, 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 you know, there's things like that that you just, you look at and you go, you know, man, I, I, was, a little, I was a little crazier back then. I, I remember when I prayed this prayer. I go back in some of my journals and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Look at that prayer. That's because I write my prayers out. I'm like, wow. Who was that guy right there? I need to meet him. God says, just look in the mirror. I'm trying to wonder where he is too. Come on, look at your neighbor. Say, over, overcome. Say, come back. Here's the last thing I want to say to you. You can overcome. You can overcome. Put Proverbs 24, 16 on the, on the screen for me if you could. Proverbs 24, verse 16. Look at this verse with me. It says, for though the righteous fall, how many times? How many times? Come on, say that loud. How many times? Come on, say it with authority. How many times? For so though the righteous fall seven times, guess what they do? They rise again. You fall down, guess what you do? You get right back up. You fall down, guess what you do? I'm not going to quit. You fall down, you just get right back up. You fall down, the enemy's standing in front of you. You go, hey, knock me down one more time. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get right back up again. You just keep knocking me down, I'm going to get right back up. You know why? Because the righteous man falls seven times. Falls seven times, but he gets right back up. You can do it. See, it doesn't matter what happens to you. It matters what happens in you. You can allow that failure to debilitate you, the fear of failure to cause you to shirk back, or you can decide right now to be like Peter and come back. And come back. Today's your comeback day. So here's what Peter does. He denies Jesus three times. The Bible tells us he goes and weeps bitterly. And so you know what he does. It's what we all do when we, when we fear failure, when we aren't able to face failure, is, is we typically go back to the thing we did before the endeavor that failed. Peter went back and said, let's go fishing. I was a good fisherman. Did it for a lot of years until I met Jesus. I let him down. Let me go back fishing. So guess what he does? He goes fishing again. He finds himself on the Sea of Galilee, looks over on the shore, and guess who's walking on the shore? Jesus, his best friend. The guy he had watched do miracles, sat, you know, and at campfires and sung songs and played the guitar with him. I don't know, maybe, you know, who knows? Had supper with him, sweet tea, Arnold Palmer's. It was his buddy on the shore. He sees him. He says, Jesus, hey! Catch anything yet? Peter says, no. Ain't caught anything, man. This stinks being out here. You know what Jesus does? He does exactly the same miracle that he did when he met Peter. He says, hey, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Throws his net on the other side. He pulls up a huge load of fish. The Bible tells us it was 153 fish. Pretty good day, I would say. Peter gets so excited. He jumps in the water, swims to the shore. Jesus has got a fish on the barbie. For the Australians, fish on the barbie. And, and, and he says, hey, let's have some breakfast. They have some fish tacos. And, and they, after the breakfast is over, Jesus, with the same look I believe he gave him when Peter denied him, looks with love and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I love you, Jesus. Jesus looks at him again and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know, Lord, I love you. Second time. Jesus turns to him third time and says, hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, Jesus, you know I love you. Three failures, three confirmations. Jesus brings him right back in and says, listen, you were never gone, Peter. You know what Peter does? He goes after that, 10 days later, gets filled with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, and preaches the first Spirit-filled message, and 3,000 people come to know Jesus Christ. Next chapter, he prays for a sick man who's been sick for 40 years. He gets healed. Everything breaks loose in Peter's life, all because he made a comeback. All because he made a comeback. My son, you know, when we moved to Charlotte, Almost 13 years ago, over 13, 13 years ago, let's just say that, 13 years ago, my son, I had a five-year-old, I had a three-year-old, and I had a one-year-old. 
And my son loved, he's sitting in the, in the front, he's 16 now, going to be 17 in a couple weeks. Crazy. Whew. It's hard being, you know, a parent of somebody that old and only 29. It's difficult. <laughs> Need some help. He loved to jump on his bed. Like he would get on his crib, you know, as a kid and jump, 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 jump. And he would get on my bed and he'd go, Daddy, look, I can jump. And he'd jump up on my bed. And one time I was walking by my, my bed and he was jumping on his bed and he just jumped off his bed. And, and I'm like, whoa, and I catch him like this. And, and he looks at me and, I'm, and he's like, yeah, thanks, Daddy. What is this awesome? And I look at him and I said, Colby, what are you doing? Why in the world did you do that? And he looked up at me and he goes, because I knew you'd catch me, Daddy. I knew you'd catch me. Somebody say, come back. Can I tell you? Your daddy is waiting to catch you. He's waiting to catch you. All you got to do is jump off the bed. All you got to do is get out of the boat. All you got to do is go up the stalk. All you got to do is take a faith risk. All you got to do is make that change today. All you got to do is say, just, do, just go for it. Maybe, maybe it's the risk of reading your Bible every day. I failed so many times. Who cares? Get up tomorrow and do it again. And then wake up. Guess what? Get up and do it again. Get knocked down, get up and do it again. Get knocked down, get up and do it again. Get knocked down, get up and do it again. Just keep getting up. You say, I'm not qualified. Just keep getting up. Just keep getting up. Why don't you stand up on your feet? Give the Lord a big clap. Come on, give him a big clap in here. Come on, give the Lord a big clap. Hallelujah. Awesome, 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 awesome. Grab somebody's hand beside you if you could. I want to pray for you. Grab somebody's hand. Father, I just break the spirit of fear off of people's lives right now. I break the spirit of fear, the fear of failure. Be gone in Jesus' name. Be free from fear that has been passed down. F poverty off of people's lives. The fear, fe I break the spirit of fear. And God, I ask you in Jesus' name, just like you said in 2 Timothy 1, that you would replace it with the spirit of love and power and of a sound mind, with faith, God. Today, I pray that people will walk out of here, God, in the name of Jesus, full of faith, energized by faith, their spirit full of faith in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and you want to start over today, you want to begin again, start a new life for Jesus. Maybe you gave your life before to him, but you failed. It's okay. Guess what? Today's the day where you can get up and you can start over again. All you have to do is just say, yes, Jesus, come and change my life today. Maybe you're here and it's the first time you've ever been in church. You've never been in this kind of environment. It's kind of blowing you away. You're like, wow, I, I, feel, I feel like something's happening inside of me. I don't know exactly what it, your heart is about to beat out of your chest. You don't know what's going on. You know what that is? That's the presence of God. And he's pulling you. He's drawing you. He's asking you to take a big step today to say yes to him, to jump off the bed and let him catch you. I'm going to count to three. When I do, if you say, that's me, I want to give my life to Jesus, I want you just to squeeze the person hand, person's hand beside you. One, two, three. Just squeeze their hand. Just squeeze their hand. Come on, squeeze it, squeeze it, squeeze it. You want to get right with God today, just squeeze that hand. Listen, if somebody squeezed your hand, would you do me a favor and just lift it up for me? Just lift their hand up. Lift that hand up. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? That is so awesome. Let's pray together. Church, join with, with them as they make this declaration. If you squeeze somebody's hand, I want you to say this out loud. Say it strong. Say it louder and with more attitude than you've ever prayed any prayer in your entire life. Just say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you died for me. I believe that your blood was shed for me. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. I give you my life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a clap and just thank him. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, dads. Happy Father's Day. We have a few things outside for you today. We'd love you to join us, throw some pitches, eat some hot dogs, hit some stuff. It's always fun. Have a wonderful Sunday. Find three people as you leave and say, today's your comeback day. Today's your comeback day. Have a great day.